I'm going to walk around a bit and I've got some notes as well. Because, sorry to shatter the illusion, um, but this is a recycled presentation. So many presentations with the help of a control C and a control V and changing a few words can be reused. I love it recycling me. This presentation was originally designed, I was invited to a session called Culture Bash in Manchester, the northwest of England, who I think as a, and correct me if I'm wrong Roger, as a local authority funding a lot of arts organisations were very aware that in the future funding would be cut or could get trimmed. So they were very keen to facilitate the C word, collaboration, uh, between venues. And the trouble with talking about collaborative projects is so many times people talk about how fantastic they are. Okay? And they booked me to do a contentious session after lunch to talk about maybe some of the bad things, which I'm going to do today with some case studies as well. Uh, that's the title I came up with. Collaboration, cooperation, confrontation, and considerable consternation. Uh, and the challenges of joining up data, working, and cross-selling. But that's quite a negative way to start. And it was me all being all corporate as well. So I changed it to let's work together, it'll be great. <laughs> as long as it works for me, and you better do as I say. And instead of being corporate, I am a self contest ticketing geek and data freak. Okay, so there's a disclaimer. Which I won't read through because there's nothing worse than someone going. The material in this presentation has been prepared. It's basically saying that a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are in the public domain. And just being a bit of a freak and a geek, I find them on websites and start to build interesting stories about them. <coughs> so the figures are out of the air, they're plucked and they're rounded. Um, so if you can invest in any of these companies that we don't talk about or don't name, but we're talking about really, be careful. Some numbers very quickly. Um, because I love, I, love, I, love, I love my numbers. Um, 16. 16 is the number of years I've been working in live entertainment, ticketing and marketing. The last seven in arts and culture, which has been incredibly challenging. The first nine were in sport, and that was a dollar. Um, 21,000, that's the largest venue that I ran. 6292. Yeah, is six or per annum? Seats. <laughs> <laughs> I only play the big kids. Uh, 6292. We have 62 organisations we work with in the UK in patron base. And I'm not talking about patron base today, although I will use it to highlight some examples without going on about it. But we have 92 venues who use it. And that's because in there, there are some venues who share a system. Because that's great. That's what we like. Zero is the figure I like to see on a conf confirmation page for booking fees. I hate them. They're the worst thing ever. And genuinely, the first time in this presentation, there was a one. But now I have to say it's the one thing I can't remember what I was going to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> true. Last 15 years to get ticketing technology, and Roger's done it in far more slides and far more graphs. Um, wow Online, I remember to this day having to plead with my finance director to allow me to spend £25 a month on an online ticketing system. And he was like, oh, well, yeah, but it's 25 quid. Are we going to really use it? Look at where we are now. Social media, Rogers murdered that one, literally. Um, you know, tweeting, Facebook, Pinterest, you know. QR codes, I, I'm not sure if they happened here. They, they kind of happened in the yeah. UK, and it was the future. Everything's got to be QR code. Never see them. Uh, NFC, uh, near field communication, is it no F chance or no F choice? You know, uh, it, again, like QR codes, people talked about N uh, NFC as being the future of what we were all going to be using. I made my first contactless payment only two weeks ago. Why? Because my bank didn't offer the tap and go type cards. Conversely, I stopped on the, on, in Tokyo on the way here. I had their travel card which was great for the metro, recharging up and using it, but I could also use it in a convenience store. When I was thirsty on the platform, I could use it to pay for uh, a soda. So that was good. But do you, does Starbucks in Auckland, in New Zealand, use uh, their contactless card? I was in San Francisco, in a Starbucks, and just amazed at these people who just came in, walked past us all in the queue, and stood at the end. And simply walking into the Starbucks, the software picks up them, knows what their regular order is, 
That would be dangerous for you with Wine Lodge. <laughs> the, um, uh, the AMA, the Arts Marketing Association, had this great phrase about data five, six years ago, these pots of gold, these spreadsheets we had lying around the organisation. But, you know, unattended data, is it a pot of gold or just this kind of bucket of useless names and addresses? Uh, we we're chatting with the guys from the court, uh, obviously a lot of movement of people. A physical name and address is, is no good, because how many people have had to move? We've now lost contact with that patron. When they reappear on our grid, are they a new customer or one who's just moved address? And of course, the big C word, collaboration. Oh dear. So this is what we're talking about because you can build a much higher tower if you share your two pots of bricks. Uh, and where John lives in Christchurch, across the road from him, is an elementary school. And there's nothing better in the morning to see the kids going out and they're playing, and it's really, really friendly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then they work in the house. Uh, perceived benefits. Uh, so Helen's touched on this, you know, the kind of customer level data. Where do I live? What's my name? What's my address? The patterns and trends, very relevant to that kind of benchmark exercise. But likewise, there's some sh the sharing of data doesn't have to be electronic. What works for you? What doesn't work for you? And already today we've had conversations about reprice <coughs> banding, different email tools. So collaboration can be just about a mentoring scheme. Well, of course, we're looking to reduce costs. Probably going to raise some income as well. But box office, can we share box office functions? Can we, you know, cross-sell? So I'm open on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Roger on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Those kind of things. The marketing effort. So, are we going to have a shared website, a, a, a citywide portal, um, shared systems of procurement? So, can we buy? We all need a new system, possibly. And we go, oh, actually, I can't really afford one. Uh, John can't currently afford one, but if we move together, we can use that um, to work uh, together better. Um, and of course, the use of consultants. But what we, we, a lot of the time we look with collaboration is to increase revenue. And that's the direct spend or the secondary spend. So I'm going to have some examples of this about what secondary spend compared to direct spend is. Rebates and commissions. So the people that act, like Roger said, Bath Box Office, who earn a dollar a ticket, by doing some kind of collaboration, they're raising revenues through helping someone else. Um, and of course, funding grants uh, and other sources. Many local authorities in the UK are saying we will only give you some pot, a pot of money to work on a project if you guys work together. Because we can't fund all of you, and if we fund one of you, there'll be a, a, a huge um, for all about how one got funding and one didn't. So again, the local authority or funding organisations driving this kind of collaboration project. And of course, what we all want is some stability. You know, <coughs> more products, bigger audiences, and of course other income. So that's the vision. What actually happens? <laughs> well, that photo. And of course, it never really gets to this stage, unless you're working in South Wales. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> because of tensions that have arisen during the project that were not identified or resolved early on in the project. We've got to this stage, and we've got this cat fight over data, over permissions, over funding, or anything else. Uh, so it's important to consider the people involved in ha how collaboration will affect other, you know, the audience, but also how, as venue operators, owners, producers, it'll affect us as well. So, the barriers and issues to, uh, to collaboration. It's all about me, because it's my data. They're my customers, they're my sales histories that I've built up over 15, 20, five, three, two years, and it's my product. I know my product, and I want to sell my product to my people. There are my rules. We don't give refunds, we don't charge booking fees, but everyone else does. So do we, do we change our own working practices or do we start to assimilate with other arts organisations who are doing the same things? And again, the rules there 
Uh, UK, uh, the Data Protection Act, uh, compared to your probably, uh, Privacy Act. Um, you know, some venues in the UK choose to interpret an act in their own way. Some are uber conservative that unless you give them a declaration signed in the, in the blood of your firstborn, they won't put you on a mailing list. Other people will put you on the mailing list and only take you off uh, if you really protest. How we do things. The brochure works for us, the website works for us, we don't like taking bookings over the phone. Um, and I know best. I know my organ organisation far more than you do, so therefore I know the best way to present it or to sell it to other people. And of course, the brand. All of you have brands. We have a brand. There's nothing worse, is there, when someone grabs your logo to do a poster and just drags it a bit, or makes it monochrome, or prints it and their ink cartridges are off when it comes purple rather than red. Okay. Now, I've got some examples in my recycling project here, so I'll explain them as I go along. <clears throat> so, first of all, does an offering work? Now, for those of you who don't know, which I'm probably saying is quite a few, John Lewis is a nationwide department store operating at the mid to low high income bracket. So it's got quite, you know, quite an audience. These are, sim these are, these are typical people, you know, Arthur and Elsie out trying to buy a new uh, set here, whatever they're looking for. So what they're going to do now in this collaboration is in their window, which is lovely laid out, is stick a poster offering a beer and burger offer for four ninety nine. Nice. So why does this not work as a piece of collaboration? Well, because Arthur and Elsie are not actually looking for a burger. They're looking for a sofa. The staff are not geared up to, recommend, to say, do you want that with curly fries? They will offer you an insurance policy on that expensive washing machine you're buying. They've got no facilities to cook or deliver burgers. I mean, they've got 20 cookers laid out in the kitchen section, uh, but no, uh, no extraction fans or anything else. And as brands, John Lewis and, let's say, Burger King, for example, are not aligned brands. They have no common goals or values. So, really, the piece of collaboration has no benefit. And the important thing is there is it has to have some benefit and either that's going to be to the customer or either party for whatever reason. <coughs> so as a result, it's an unwanted, confusing and very costly to implement project. So Yates is, <coughs> this is all about competition. Yates is a, they build themselves still as a wine bar. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, they are a <laughs> mid to low drinking <coughs> house that you'll find in not the nicest areas of neighbourhoods sometimes. Um, and that looks, that looks nice, but inside they're a bit dodgy. So they're going to put a sign outside saying, why don't you drink at Witherspoons, who are a similar organisation. They have the same catchment, they have the same kind of occupation in terms of the CBD, or just outside the CBD. So I'm going to be walking down, desperate for a cheap pint, and go, oh, I forgot there was a Witherspoons down there. I'm going I'm to head off down here for a pint now. Why that doesn't work as a piece of... Co collaboration is Yates has done all the work they've got the best place on the high street they've put flyers out, they've got me to come to their door and at the last minute <coughs> I go to the Weatherspoons pub Weatherspoons are benefiting from that they're not telling people back the other way but that's a bit of collaboration they also start to believe that their own footfall and incomes are healthy and sustainable, unaware that a lot of people have just been diverted 200 yards <coughs> So they start to reduce their marketing spend, the advert comes down, and suddenly they're both in trouble. And it's unfair as a piece of collaboration because it drives business from one to the other, whether it's got the benefit, and it alters perceptions. People think they're the same brand because why else would you be recommending I go somewhere else? Mutually beneficial. Now you can see I do a lot of drink and burger type uh, case studies. Um, so what a lovely bar. So we've got the good spirit section there. I'm sure we could find some room for some cross promotion. So there we go. They've got a free kebab meal uh, deal. Okay. That's a complex deal, so we'll get the notes. Okay. That works. 
because if you've been have, knocking a few back, you might want to find something to eat. So this is the offer. You purchase five pints, you get a coupon, they stamp it, that allows you to buy a, get a, a, a large kebab instead of a, for the price of a regular one. Quite low tech, you know, stamping a card with a little stamp like you used to get in Starbucks or anywhere else. You hand it into the kebab shop to claim. The bar pays, oh, uh, pays half the, the difference. So actually that quite, that, that's got some synergy really as a deal. Why? <coughs> because it is actually raising revenue, not just diverting it in the Yates and Weatherspoon offer. It encourages the extra point, because uh, you'd need to drink five pints before you can stomach a kebab anyway. <laughs> it's, it's more reinforcing that trip that maybe you're gonna make, but it's just now kind of pushing you to that extra sale. Great, because you know both, both parties benefit from it, so we've re re removed that kind of beneficial barrier. <coughs> there's no real threat because, you know, you aren't, there's no way you have a kebab on an empty stomach. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't get directly to that deal. You can't say, God, I love kebabs, I'm just going to go straight there. You have to do some kind of purchase first. The customer's thankful. The customer gets benefit. You know, we're both getting, you know, in the bar, we're saying there's extra points. In Kebabarama, they're getting all these, uh, I, I suppose it's lamb, uh, kind of pizza bread things put together. You know, and maybe there's even kind of a, a staff incentive in that as well. So they can get a benefit of it as well. Okay? So the issues with that, now I sell technology. I love technology. What I love about that offer is it doesn't involve technology. Because too many times with collaboration or anything we do in our lives, it's you have to have an iPad, you have to have this, you have to have anything else. But it's an example of a really simple piece of collaboration. Everyone understands it. It's quite simple to get five stamps and then get your, uh, your free voucher. Really important one, it's really easy to start doing something. To stop it is incredibly hard. When you've got money out there, you've got vouchers out there, you've got credit issued to people, gift vouchers, anything else to retire that. But of course you can't please everyone because I'm a fried chicken fan, not a kebab fan. I don't drink, I, I'm a designated driver. So I, I'm somehow excluded from that offer and I'll be promoting <coughs> binge drinking or on a healthy diet. So however good the, the deal is, it does um, always have, or this collaboration has, there'll always be people that find maybe holes in it. So what collaboration must always therefore do is have benefit. And it should be, as arts organisations, one of us, or all of us, or our funders, or other people, must benefit from this collaboration project. If it's customer facing, so that kind of kebab offer, the customer must really find it useful. Again, be relevant, so those old couple buying the washing machine, they don't want a burger. But it's really important that you, you work out in collaboration <coughs> an exit strategy. Because you can start sharing a flat with somebody, but when you stop sharing a flat with them, you have to do that carve up of bills and, you know, whose CD is this, and well, I bought half that sofa, so I'm going to cut it down the middle and split it apart. Okay? And more importantly, collaboration is great for us to get that stability, but we can never rely on it and fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing okay. So I'm going to do some case studies now of some joined up working. That with few exceptions, there are unnamed venues. Because there are a few howlers and a few good things and some few financials in there as well. Um, and I want to talk about the kind of positive and negatives of this piece of joined up these pieces of joined up working. Okay. The unnamed motorsport event. This was really fun. I worked on this one. So this was a unnamed motorsport event that was for the first time ever putting it on in a city and at that venue. Um, I didn't know how special it was and how much the, the participants of that event loved it. And the organisers had said very much that there was this word, or this phrase, walk-up culture. 
So they've done the research and realised we're going to have tens of thousands of people descending upon us very quickly at the last minute, therefore we need to plan our ticketing strategy around it. <clears throat> so they were looking for partner sales locations. Now at the time, I ran a venue not far from this one, and we collaborated on quite a simple level, that when one of us had a big event, we lent car park space to each other. So VIPs were guaranteed somewhere nice to, to park, we had a shuttle bus going on, and we shared some box office functions. So we thought, hey, why don't we work together on selling some tickets? Maybe we can make a few quid. Customer group one. So I was working on the box office counter, all my box office staff had gone for a break, and so I was sat there with no people going on, and this fam, pretty much exactly this family, started to approach the ticket booth. The only difference is the guy in real life had these trousers held up with a piece of rope <laughs> with a big knot at the front. So I'm looking at him, I'm profiling him, because we love to profile, don't we? So they came down, and he said to me, he said, what tickets you got, mate? So you might want to duck down, Roger. So <laughs> I said, oh, and the price range was 20 to $200. So I profiled them, that's a value carrier bag, he's drinking value lager with his rope tied up. I said, oh, these ones are 20, these ones are 50, and these ones are 75. So he kind of peers through, he goes, how much are them ones there? I said, oh, sir, they're, they're $200 each. There's no concessions for children. He said, oh, that's great, I'll have five. And he pulls out a wad of money and without batting an eyelid, rolls off oh, just over $1,000 with booking fee. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm flexible sometimes. Um, and, you know, he then, you know, grabs his tickets, he turns away, and I hope they had a really great time at the event. Turns out, it's not always the case, they're $200 for a reason, because for this particular sporting event, that's the best place to sit. Not the start finish line, they're only 50, but 200 is the best one. Customer group two. I'm going to call him Jeremy. Uh, but Jeremy, little Todd, comes strolling down, and he's got designer shirt and their kids, you know, kids Levi's jeans. And he says, Oh, we've come to see that unnamed sporting event. How much are your tickets? And I said, Oh, I've got this, because we were on the second book. Those are 200, those are 100, uh, and those are 75. And he said, what's the cheapest ticket you have? And I went, oh, that'll be those ones extra. They're $20 each. And he kind of went, tell you what, Todd, let's go to the park. And walked away, and then made a sale. <laughs> so, where I got that wrong, <coughs> really, and I've used it so many times since, it was, I was profiling them based on my, uh, my, their, their perceived wealth to me, not the value they placed in the product. And we had a great chat in, in, in one of the breaks there, talking about how should I price my auditorium, should my best seats be the top price, um, and of course what Roger's doing with uh, the Pricing Institute of the States uh, about you know, hot spotting. So I kind of started on the, on the back foot, I was really confused with what I was selling. I really wonder, did I cause either one of those groups offence by saying, I only think you, you, can, you, you, know, you value or you can spend $20? Um, the guy that walked away, I really wonder that if I'd actually said there's $20 first, he'd have gone, oh, that's quite good. Did he not want to have the cheapest seats uh, and there's a great uh, study from, uh, just that came out in the UK last week about wine, which I enjoy a little bit of. And they have proven now the most popular wine on wine list, the most bought, is the second most... Uh, second cost. lowest cost. Lowest cost. Because nobody wants to pick the cheapest or the least, you know, uh, the least costly one. So people naturally then go, Oh yeah, that, that, that does look quite nice. I'll have, a, I'll have a bottle of that. So now, wine um, cafes are pushing the wines they want to get rid of to more money and selling more of it just by pushing it down 
priceless. But I did make some money on the Garcia Bushby piece, I didn't go that bad. There's no doubt the fact that if you've got a $20 ticket and a $200 ticket, the perception of value must be that the seat that's a tenth of the price has got to be cracked. You know, yeah, it's but, behind but, a bridge but, on but, the circuit. Yeah, but, you know, this, this, this venue, there's not really a bad seat in it. You can, and I have sat, albeit with a cop, you know, in a $20 seat that was fine. You know? But they don't know that. No. But also it's part of, again, not understanding what you're selling. And going back to that, you know, different organisations that are here, if they talk about cost over for each other, understanding the value people put in a, in a price. So, and you cannot mention who this is. <coughs> Two venues who were looking to buy a system together. And the reason they were doing that is because they had some funding uh, on the basis of collaboration. Okay. So what we want is we want this great system where we can both use it and uh, we can save some money and we can get our data, we can do some profiling, um, but not for certain events because, no, they're my events. Th those events are our blue ribbon events. I don't want them to get access to those events. We want to sell those ones only. Oh, and don't let them, don't let them look at our seating plans and see how bad an event is or how good an event is selling because they're going to alter their marketing. I said, well, how can they sell your tickets if they can't see what you have available? Oh, and definitely don't let them look at our donors. <laughs> because if they find out we've got a high value donor, they'll steal them. So what they were really saying is they didn't trust each other. And that's really sad that of all the things that you want to do, you get down to a level when you say, I just don't trust them. But it ended happily. They both bought their own system. They're both live with their own system. Um, the only thing one of them is a bit annoyed about is it took so long to get through this process to agree, and they agreed quite nicely, when we're not going to work together, that it really affected, actually affected both of them, but maybe one of them more than the other. Okay. The only people disappointed were the Arts Council. <laughs> It's being recorded. I don't know. Who are you? Um, <laughs> so let's have a look at some same organisation cooperation. Because if you're in the same organisation, you are probably guaranteed to want to work better with your colleagues. exception. Why? Because you've got an aligned business. You're all in it together. Um, you've got the same management structure, so your CEO can force you. <coughs> Um, or, or influence you, um, you've got those kind of common goals, you, you, this is how you work, you all understand the brand. Anyone name where that is? And the name of the hotel? The Bellagio. Famously robbed by Daniel Ocean in the second, not real, Ocean's 13. 11, 12, one of them. So, it's a beautiful building. So this is, it's actually owned by a company called MGM Resorts. And they have a lot of their resorts shows by the, you know, the famous brand Soak Soleil. Um, and they're all friendly because they're all part of the same group. Yet there's a, there's a little bit of competition going on because uh, not all of them actually have shows. A lot of their competition there is for people's time as well as their money because you're only there for three days. Um, and seven out of the eight Cirque du Soleil shows in Las Vegas are in MGM properties. Bit of a cup. Two performances a day, five days a week, four to six weeks a year, about a thousand seat auditorium, seven venues, 3.2 million tickets a year potential. God, the ticket range. Gives you an idea of, you know, if they sell every seat at the lowest price, you'd be looking at revenues of $300 million a year. So what's the positives of that kind of cooperation? Well, it's brilliant because you can phone up and you can say, I'm coming in, I'm in town next week. What have you got that's a really good ticket? I want a 7.30 show rather than a 9.30 show. Uh, the, well, obviously, at, at box office as well, so you can go and buy one show, buy another. They're really good on this kind of leaving one show promotion. So like that kind of um, kebab offer, 
you get a, a flyer in your hand for a next uh, Cirque show, say half price, whatever it is, but you only get access to that on the out of a, of a show. And it's very carefully coordinated that they're driving people to different shows. And of course you've got packaging. <clears throat> Everyone likes to talk about packages, hotels, meals, those kind of things. Every square inch, digital and traditional media, is based on getting you to go to that show. When you arrive in your hotel, it'll say, welcome, Mr. Thomas. Have you thought about going to one of their resident shows? The beer mat on one side has the brand, on the other side has the show. Posters, interactive screens, taxi cabs, the concierge when he welcomes you. If you, if I, if you want me to get your tickets, let me know. I've got some great tickets lined up. But the negatives it, uh, are, even though they're in the same group, is that individual properties want to push their own show first. Because the whole idea of getting people to come to your venue in the first place is not necessarily to see the show, but we want you know, on property for your alcohol and your gambling spend afterwards. Real perception of them. Like Mr. String Trousers, some of their resorts are five star or five diamond resorts. They have a perception to only attract people from other five diamond resorts because we want people who are going to spend lots of money. Oh, we don't want people from that one or that one, because they're not going to be as like to spend. And ultimately, you end up, as I hearted there, with this kind of relentless bombardment of material. So you get confused. So the get out. We all know the phrase get out. One of the properties was sold. So now, they've lost that collective, they've lost that collective agreement, that, that they're out flyering, they're not having people push to them from other shows, they're not appearing on all the big billboards with all the seven shows. The question is, is it a positive? Because now they can do whatever they like. They can come up with their own offer. They haven't got a, they haven't got a brief seven box offices on this new cross promotion. But probably I'd say only to counteract the negatives. Oh, it's great now because now we can do this, which those so and so's never let us do before. So outside, they're in trouble. Interestingly, uh, the big subscription went on sale this week, and you, so you pick, like, it's called Cirque Week, we all big fans go to, go to Las Vegas, you can pick you know, shows for a list. You can't do it online, because now one of those venues is using a different system, and it's not all compatible, so you have to phone up, which is great if you're in the US, if you're in Europe, or you're in or Asia, Asia, or all the way down here. It's not so good, because your timelines aren't, aren't uh, kind of lined up. So the key things with collaboration is, you know, especially when we're, we're doing that, this kind of competition, is there's always going to be competition. There always has been, there always will be, even in, in the same organisation. You know, some of us who work in venues that have got three restaurants, some of those actually compete against each other with the best offer, the best menu for people to come in. And just because you have these huge numbers and potential savings doesn't necessarily make it the right thing to do. <clears throat> and basically, trying to understand what your collaboration view is. Would you prefer... Oh, it's cold, cold, is your view oh, it's colder on the outside, not being part of this project, or are you out to the project saying, I'd rather be Marshall and Destiny? And when you break up, what's the phrase you use? <laughs> it's not you, it's me, it's my brand, I just don't, you know, oh, I just want something different. Uh, and, and who gets the dog? The dog being... Uh, in a lot of projects, the data. Who owns the data? Who owns it? No one, no one owns the data. It's owned by the customer. But you do have these issues of slicing up data. So, you know, um, am I against collaboration? No, I'm not. Um, but as Helen and I were chatting about upstairs, it's about that small print. We can great, we can have this view, but projects do get delayed so much by the intricacies of the data sharing policy. You know, have we got, and I'm doing one at the moment for, for the Ordnance Agency in the UK, who are doing a big collaboration project. So every day we're getting in signed forms from our venues, allowing us to share our data or push through the DDX up to this kind of big data warehouse. But, you know, uh, so it takes a huge amount of time to build, um, but can take longer to pick apart at the end. Um, and if collaboration fails, because we don't do it or we do it badly, 
there's going to be a loss. And that loss could be financially, or more worryingly, because we haven't taken this step and the chance to collaborate, that we lose a theatre. You know, um, and, and the, like the first thing I heard uh, landing in, in Christchurch or, or the day after was, was downstage. You know, about downstage. You know? So, back to the recycling message. The reason I want to finish on that is because recycling is what we can all do. You know, there have been collaboration projects in lots of territories, in lots of different ways, from the, the data warehousing and benchmark exercise that CNZ are doing now to venues joining up systems. So just like I've done with my presentation today, I would really recommend all of you, if you think about it, is to go out and look and learn and ask about the things people wish they considered earlier. Uh, because you know you can you can spend a lot of time writing a presentation that's not relevant, mm -hmm. or you could maybe just tweak a few figures in it and try and make it a bit more relevant. So that's my message to you really was would be to collaboration. We've got to do it, um, but we need to really take time, but not too much time to get it right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs>